I want to start by acknowledging and thanking the Tiwa speaking peoples that understand from this area. I want to acknowledge and thank the organizers and the sponsors. And I mention in particular Ine Slaughter, who has been so helpful in organizing things, and Jerry Hill, the president of ILI, and all the others that I haven't had the pleasure of meeting. So I say to you, miigwech, get a thumb in, get an oscom ten, ekusi, tiniki, ekustani. Thank you. I am uh, somewhat uh, uh, petrified at the prospect of speaking to indigenous language teachers on matters about which you are the experts, and I am someone who doesn't do that, and I don't know that. And particularly so at a conference dealing with healing and trauma. So I will be a student listening to people who are speaking about these ideas that are new to me. So I'll be very interested. What I will aim to speak about is what I think I know. I will speak about things that I have lived, about things that I have experienced, things that I have seen, that I've smelled, that I've heard, and also some things that I've read. But I'll try to explain in each case. I was very happy when I saw the uh, agenda for this conference that uh, the next speaker is from uh, Turtle Mountain. Is that you? Yeah, it's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, I know people there, and I've been there. And uh, some of the, I can speak to those people down there. Uh, I was so delighted when I first visited Turtle Mountain and met people there. And Somebody said some expressions that I thought we were the only community in the planet that used it. It made me feel at home right away. I was so, we were so comfortable when I spoke to elders there. So it's, uh, uh, we're the same people, uh, notwithstanding that border. Um, and it, the way we have always identified ourselves is you may shift. And they do too, down in that area. And they said, Paul, you keep that Métis up north. My father died in, uh, 19, in uh, he would have been uh, in 1984. And uh, he would have never heard the word Métis. He would have never heard that. You know, we, we didn't say it that way, but that's, that's what happens. So I've had the, pleasure of, uh, or the challenge of living in four, <clears throat> four distinct cultures. Uh, most of all the Michif culture for a total of about three decades. And uh, in the English Canadian for maybe the same time. In the French Canadian for one year, I went to a residential school. And in the uh, Australian culture for almost a decade. I actually acquired citizenship. I lived in Australia for some time and studied law there and other things. So these are some of the places where I picked up, I suppose, some of the ideas that I have because I'm able to compare the ways that people live, the ways that people speak, and the, 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 the fine differences, because I've lived them. But I don't know your languages, so I'm not gonna talk about that. I will talk about what I think I know, as I try to say. 
So my initial observations are these, that I grew up, I like to say, when I was, when I was young, uh, I say, I, I, I was young once. <laughs> and now that I'm three quarters of a century, um, I remember when I turned 25, uh, I was a baseball player, I was a pitcher, and my catcher was a young man from Visalia, California. And I turned 25 that summer, and he said to me, Paul, you are now a quarter of a century. Suddenly, I, I felt that weight on my shoulders. Boy, I'm old. <laughs> well, I'm three quarters now. But uh, I was going to say that, that I grew up with the ideas, the values, the taboos, the social behavior, the body language of an indigenous language. The language affected me. It affected how I saw myself. It affected how I expected others to see me. My name. When I'm in a big city, I'm anonymous. But if I'm in my community, then I'm a part of it. Everybody knows me. But I'm in a small place or in a neighborhood, in your region, People, oh, that place is from that place. Oh, that name, we know that name. You see, so your identity is drenched in your actual life experience, your family, where you grow up. And you can't shake these things. And yes, as far as trauma is concerned, there is shame. I have to say that, you know, growing up, one feels ashamed because of the way that people view what I would say, people like me or people who speak like I grew up speaking. And I've worked very, very, very hard for decades to try to speak English the way English people speak. I still mess up once in a while. My children say, yeah, that's not the way you say it. Now, As a child, I didn't ask questions. I didn't wonder too much about anything. I assumed that the whole world was the same, same as I lived. I didn't realize that other people lived different ways, so I didn't think that we were poor or hard up. Although now, looking back, when people ask me about things, I say, yeah, cars? What was that? <laughs> we, we used horses and sleighs and, 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 and uh, sleighs in the winter time. We didn't have electricity. None of these modern things. Life was very, very different then. So we've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of changes. But I'll tell you one of the things that sticks out in my mind about when I started thinking back, because I, I said, in my experience, it's not natural to wonder when you're little, but when you're growing up, in your family, your community, you accept everything. But I started, I think the, the time that I started to wonder was when a distinguished historian asked me a question. Jennifer Brown, uh, who's written, you know, a lot. And she retired, living in Denver, Colorado now. <laughs> we were on our way to a conference, a history conference. And she said to me, Paul, I wonder if you can help me understand something. She says, uh, I was reading these old manuscripts, and uh, one of the names of the, of the chiefs there was in French. It was Cuadet, <laughs> which means bare bum, uh, you know, in English. And uh, so she said, what do you know about that? And that was a big revelation to me because you don't think about the things you grew up with. And I started laughing because it took me back home. It took me back to the names that we have. It took me back to the nicknames that we give people. And then I said, oh yes, 
That's why we kept quiet when we went to the city. Because some of our names were such that they would have made nuns faint in the streets. You see, and I'm not going to share some of them because I don't know the culture of all the people who are here and you might be shocked and I don't wish to shock anyone. So I am censoring my own talk here today so as to meet my goal of not offending anybody. But I can, I, 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 uh, I'm going to say a few things about the culture and the language and uh, hopefully uh, it might mean something. Um, we have, where I grew up, uh, I suppose a unique naming culture. We give people nicknames and they, have, they can have a number of nicknames. And when I grew up, there's some people I knew, some of my cousins had two, three, four names. And I remember one time I was re reading an obituary, Chartrand, somebody, I'm looking, I wonder who died. And I'm looking, boy, this, his brothers leaves behind. And I recognize all their names. I said, those are all my cousins. And I, well, so who is it that died? I didn't recognize his name. He had four names. I didn't know what his, his actual official name was. See, so, uh, that was, that's common, I, you know, so I'm speaking about what I know. I don't know what it's like where, where you're from. And I have to say that my perception now is that our accent and some of our words and approaches are more like the uh, Ojibwe people. The, the way we say words is more like the tr. People that really know languages in Canada, they know where I'm from just by listening to me. You know, because if you live further west, you, have, you don't say tr kind of thing. You go tse, like that. You know, when I was young, I said, well, they sound like sissies, those people, the way they talk. You know, so <laughs> so uh, there are those kind of uh, differences. So we had names like, and Pat, I'll, I'll, I'll mention some of them, and, and I'm sure you'll uh, just for the heck of it, Shununun. Uh, I don't even know what these names are, what they mean in many cases. In some cases I do, sometimes I don't know. Maybe they're just made up, but Shununun, Mitek, Tutushima, Shungish, Milanki, Chikapesh. So those are some actual uh, names, and I, I know at least one of them, uh, you know, and, and, and what it means. It's a late friend of mine. Almost all my friends are late friends now. At my age, that's, that's life. Um, but, uh, so we have, our language is very, I think, very similar to the Cree and Ojibwe cultures as well, because I've participated in all those cultures, professionally and personally. And what I see is, no, really no difference. There's no, there's no real difference. But there is linguistic difference though. I want to point that out. The, the ones who studied my language are mainly outsiders. Uh, maybe someone knows why that might be. I don't know. People from Europe study it. They come from Europe. I met an Italian woman came to my house last year and spoke to me, Italy. And she's doing a doctorate degree. Um, uh, one, there's a big book by a, a Dutch scholar. And the first ones that I know about who did the study, it was based on Turtle Mountain. And, and then later on was, uh, I forget his name. That's one of the things that happens. When my age. I forget the man's name. But he was a North Dakota linguistics uh, uh, professor. So it's a strange thing that outsiders are the ones who have uh, looked at our languages. By the way, Pat and others, about the nicknames there, you know what I snuck in is I snuck in, I snuck in a, a, a nickname that's based on the Ukrainian language. <laughs> just, to see, uh, uh, just to be mischievous, I suppose. Um, Uh, 
there are taboos. And personally, I find it very get hard to get rid of a taboo. In fact, I can't. One that you grew up with, you know, and uh, they'll not be important to other people, but we had a formality and it, it wasn't right, simply taboo to use first names with strangers or with elders. And now you know the world has changed like everybody is Chuck. You know, it doesn't matter what your position is. Uh, you know, 16 year old clerks, everybody calls you by your first name. And I cringe inside every time. I can't help it because I'm not used to that because they're breaking a big taboo that I grew up in. If you know what taboo is, a cultural taboo, it's, a, it's, it's inside you and you, you, can't, you can't shake it out. But one point I want to make is that in my experience, many of the differences, cultural differences that are manifested through language are subtle. And that's what makes the subject that we're dealing with difficult. The differences sometimes are very subtle. It took me decades to realize that if I said certain things to outsiders, by outsiders meaning not within my culture, they might take offense. I didn't know that, but it took me decades. Because how are you supposed to know? That, you know, where I come from, when we say these things, it's not to be taken seriously. This is not, you know, I'm not angry with you, <laughs> you know, so uh, it's a different way of thinking about the world. It's very hard for me to express these things, to describe them in any details. I can't, but I want to say that that's, that's my experience. That's what I live. Maybe it's not the same for other people. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the sense of humor of our, of our people. That's what I grew up with. And that's what I say that in my later life, I found out that the Korean Soto people that I've associated with also have a similar approach. As a friend of mine put it, we have an overgrown funny bone. So I'm going to tell you a few a few short stories and expressions that, I, that in my culture are hilarious. Feel free to laugh, and if you don't, the speech might get a lot shorter here today. So. <laughs> but anyway, the first one is, I was about seven or eight years old. I remember this distinctly, and we were in this, it was hot in the summertime, and we were outside the house because it was so hot, and, and uh, it was a July evening, we were making smoke in a pail with green grass to, because there were mosquitoes around. And uh, somebody came. My father was there and some of my brothers and so on. And we were just hanging around. And a neighbor comes up, Poto. That was his, his name. Not his real name. I don't even know what his real name is, but that was Poto. Poto comes up and he wanted to use a phone. This, so this is in the early 50s. We had a telephone. Not, not many people had a telephone. So this man comes up, he said to my dad, I'd like to use your telephone. And my dad said, why do you want to use a telephone? I want to phone the doctor. He said, oh, why do you want to phone the doctor, Poto? He says, it's my heart, he says. What's wrong with your heart? Well, he says, it's going like this, he says, and it won't stop. My father thinks, he says, Poto, you're lucky it won't stop. <laughs> but, but anyway, one time my cousin, my cousin's name is Mitik. He came to visit my father when my father was in his 80s and he was all internalized. He was all scrunched up and at that time he was in a wheelchair. He was blind. 
and, you know, he had diabetes, he became blind, and so on, so on. So couldn't hear very well. So Matik says to him, he says, Uncle, Uncle, I've come to see you. My father is there, he says. Well, look. <laughs> I'll tell one about my uncle. Um, the stories, I grew up with lots of stories. I grew up with stories back in the old days, really old days, just like the stuff you see in movies, but I, I can't tell stories all day. But I'll tell you one about my uncle some people think is a little interesting. Uh, my uncle was, uh, it, this must have happened in the 30s because in Canada in the period in the 1930s, the laws changed and they started to regulate things that we'd been doing for a long time, like trapping and hunting and fishing and that. Before, you know, there wasn't that much regulation or at least enforcement. So there's several stories about people encountering official regulation. So this is one of them. So we were trappers, muskrat trappers. My father was a muskrat trapper. So was my grandfather, my mushroom. So that's one of the things we do. And uh, there's a, a, a rule now that said that if you're a trapper and you happen to find a wounded duck, suppose, you know, because sometimes a duck will sit in a trap and break a leg, that kind of thing. If you find a wounded duck, it's okay to, to keep that duck because otherwise there's a closed season in the spring. You're not allowed to hunt ducks, you see. So the uh, uh, game warden, the enforcement officer, sees my uncle, his older brother to my father, big man. And uh, he's got a mallard. And he says, let me see that mallard. And he hands him the mallard. And the game warden looks at the mallard. And he says, doesn't seem to be anything wrong with this duck. And my uncle says, then how come he's dead? I have a cousin, his, 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 his nickname is Chabé. I'm not sure what his real name is, but anyway, Chabé. <laughs> He's dead now. <laughs> but this man was the best storyteller I've ever heard in my life. Honest. He is up here. Everybody else I've heard on TV, anywhere else, they're down, they start down here. This man was really good, so there's no chance on, on earth that I can do justice to him. You, you can't. You'd rather go listen to him talk than go to a movie, even if it's Technicolor or whatever they call the color and sound nowadays. You know, it, it's just unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. He would turn the most ordinary, mundane event into an amazing, like, wonderful story. I, I've never heard anybody else with that kind of talent. But one thing I noticed, it's a very dangerous enterprise to try to tell a funny story if you don't know the characters. Because when you tell it at home, everybody knows that character. So you say an opening line, they know right away, oh, something happening here. You're expecting it. You're kind of revving. You know, that's like an engine. <laughs> and you're waiting for it. But if you tell it to strangers, it's not funny. So I'm going to give you an example. This one is kind of funny. Well, it's not that funny, but I'll find out soon. Uh, Chabé says he was hunting, as he always did, and it was getting dark. And you have to realize that we have certain ways of describing these things. You know, when you say it's getting dark, you say it in a certain way. So you know what the light was like when, it, when he's talking, you know, that story. So you got a good idea. So it was getting dark. And he sat, he had a fire and he sat on a log. Then he saw these two eyes. Oh, so he grabbed his rifle. Aim, bang, and the eyes, they stayed there. So when you know Chabé, you know there's something very strange, because he doesn't miss, you see? 
said, uh, oh, so of course he's surprised. So he goes a little closer, shoots again. The eyes are still there. Well, goes closer again. Bang! The eyes, then he looks, holy smokes, he says. It wasn't just one wolf there. There were two of them, he said, and they were, they were doing like this, he said. <laughs> Bing! Between the head. But anyway, there's... You know, there's some strange things in our language, in our culture. Some I thought I'd never seen anywhere else. And some I haven't seen anywhere else, but I heard it happens somewhere else too. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. So this I know is common with, I think, both Ojibwe and Cree. It's, it's soft words. There's softness and hardness in our language. So if you say a word, someone is speaking, and you say, ka, you, you say ka, you can't shout that across a river. It has to be said in a relaxed way. <laughs> so what it means is, uh, it, it's hard to translate directly, but the way we use it, it means I'm listening, you know, carry on, or oh, that's interesting, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing, you know? So it's an acknowledgement that the listener has not fallen asleep, you know? And I, my father used to say that a lot when I was little, telling him stuff. So <clears throat> short expressions that mean a lot. We have some of that. That's a soft one. I'm going to give you an example of a hard one. The, we have an expression that you use, it's very hard to explain when you got to live this, to know when this, you say this, but you say it when, to say within the family, and something happens to someone, and you do the opposite of commiserating, instead of saying, oh, I feel sorry for you, you're you kind of just lay it on, it's kind of hard to explain, but you go, Wah! you see, and you say that, there's no way you can do that softly. You have to do it hard, like, you know, you have to put everything into it. You put your heart into it, you know, and say, good for you, kind of like, you know, but, <laughs> you mean, you're, you, you know, <laughs> it's really hard to explain exactly what it means. But, that's, you know what I, I notice when I say that a language and a culture has softness and hardness in it? It reminds me of something I've learned just through experience about the philosophy of Anishinaabe people and related peoples, which is that, and I've learned it, I think I mentioned the elder Gordon Wendemans one time in a ceremony uh, back. I've learned everything has in it the seeds of its own opposite. You know, so something soft is also hard and all those kinds of things. It's very difficult. I'm sure smart people who philosophize you don't know all these sorts of things, but I think I've appreciated it. We have other things that we do. Body language, that's another one. Body language. I've had to rid myself of body language as I grew up and lived in a non metrif world. And I don't know how widespread some of these things are. There's one that's common. I know both, I think, Anishinaabe and uh, Cree, Nehewak, I think they do that too, which is pointing lips. You know, so if you're in the U.S., you're in a big hall, you say, where can I buy some fried bread? You know, people, <laughs> you'll, they'll point you over there, you know, so. But I know that not everybody uses that because I went to a conference in Chicago one time, indigenous things or other, I don't remember what. And uh, I asked that to a lady, a, she was an indigenous woman, and I don't remember where she was. She was from somewhere in the United States. And I think when I was trying to tell her, because I'm interested to find out, you know, do you people do this? Do you know that? And that's all I was trying to do, but I think she thought I was trying to kiss her or something. You know, so, oh. so I said, well, she doesn't understand any of this stuff. You know, so that's why I say I was petrified this morning to speak, because I don't know what these, how these people, I don't know how you think or live or speak. 
So it's a, it's a dangerous thing. We have other things too, some of which I don't, I don't dare do because <laughs> I don't know what you're going to think, but there, there's one that involves, and I'm not going to do it because I, I, I'm too shy, but it involves the, you have to snap your head and, and you say some expressions that if you said it in at least what people call white company in Winnipeg, people would look at you and they'd be shocked, you see, so we don't do that anymore. But uh, you, you, you say a very snappy, loud expression and you snap your head. And so some people know it and I've been asking people for a long time, where do they do it? They do it at home where I grew up, and I found out they do it in Pine House, Saskatchewan. That's what I found out. Way out there, on the Churchill River, I think it is. So why is that? That's a mystery. But we have lots of mysteries in our language. There are mysteries, you know, in, in, the, in the midst of history, as they would say. One of them is a song. It's a song without words. I don't know if you've ever heard anything like that. We have that. I grew up with it. Everybody is, is well known. You know, there's a rhythm to it. You know, I'm not going to sing. I, I'm terrible. I got a hard time playing the radio. I have no talent, you know, but, uh, but it, it's a song. You know, in, in, in private, I can do it a little bit, but it's dying now. But it's a song without words. Well, I should say that. It's a song that has words, but the words are not real words. Like, nobody knows what those sounds are. And I've asked people who speak our language, I've asked Ojibwe speakers, I've asked Cree speakers, nobody knows. Some people speculate about the origins of it. So, uh, that's one of those things. Those things are dying. Those things are dying. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's not like a, an immigrant language. You know, if the German language or other language died, it would survive in Germany. But if an indigenous language dies, it dies absolutely. And that's a great loss. And that is why it is such a wonderful thing that, that you are doing as people who are preserving the language. So I commend you um, for that. Um, There's one thing, a little comment I want to make. As you can hear, my comments are in a way disjointed because I don't have a big theory. I'm just speaking about what I think I know, you know, about language and culture. So it's all kinds of little experiences, I suppose, that I'm trying to offer. One is, what about this idea of comparing? What is it about comparing things? Comparing language, comparing culture. It's done a lot nowadays. Is that a smart thing? Is that a good thing? I don't know. I don't know. But here's what I experienced. I met some people who uh, I'm not going to mention the communities they're from, but not from Canada, from somewhere in the Middle East, and they follow a particular religion. And in some of my public service, I met some of these people, and they invited me to speak to their conference, and I learned a lot from them. And I, I was really impressed by how I thought that their values were really similar to our values, the values of indigenous people as I understood them. And I, I held that view for some years. Oh boy, they're more like us than these other people in Canada. And then I spent some time, around about 10 years ago, I spent most of my, uh, my time at Australian National University as a visiting, you know, they have these nice titles there for people in university, so I had one of these big titles and I was there for most of a year. And one of the people I met there was a professor in the law school where I was, and he was a Buddhist monk. And I, I, I talked with him and I told him 
oh, these people here from the Eastern religions, they, they're much more like the indigenous people than those other people in uh, Canada and the United States. Then he set me straight, because this, this man knew a lot about philosophies and ideas. And he said, no, no, he said, if you look, and then he gave me examples of other people. And another, so that made me think, maybe when you see these differences, maybe they're more superficial than they really are. And then I sat one time on a policy commission, and one of the commissioners with me was a woman who grew up in Scotland. And she became a lawyer when she immigrated to Canada, when she was an adult. Then she became a judge of the Supreme Court of Canada. And I remember one thing she said, is she said, because we were doing some comparisons, and she said, you have to be careful with comparisons, because we're humans. And if we're comparing, we're likely to pick some of the better parts of ourselves and some of the, you won't do the same for the other people. So I don't know, I don't know. What I do is I hesitate to reach conclusions, but I don't feel badly about being in a situation where I I'm very cautious about reaching conclusions because I think that that's the way the world should be. I think it's a world to wonder at. That's my understanding of what people mean when they say it's a wonderful world. I'd like to say a little bit about the languages of the Michif people. Again, focusing essentially on what I've experienced. Oh yeah, the, the language is really uh, what, what I will compare it like, this is from experience. Again, this is not a scholarly analysis you're listening to. What I find our language is like, it's like the Jamaican Patois. I don't know if any of you know that language. I understand English. Those people are speaking English. I've been there. I've heard the locals speak Patois. I couldn't understand a word. And, and so <laughs> it's similar. Like the language I grew up with is largely based on an archaic, what I call fur trade time, French. One linguist looked at it and he said, it's a living linguistic museum. A lot of the words are from the archaic French that people don't use anymore. And sometimes we use those French words, but they don't mean what they mean in French. That makes it a little tricky. And of course, we don't pronounce them the same way. So that's why I say it might be like the Jamaican patois. And then the syntax is also different. Our syntax is, I think, more like Anishinaabe way. You know, like if you look subject, predicate, those kinds of things, you kind of speak in a way that's kind of jumbled if you look at it from a French or English uh, perspective. We have uh, documents from the 1800s about our people because in Canada what happened is the government wanted to buy out the land ownership of the indigenous people. So without telling you a really long story, and I think during this conference, if people wish to learn more about those kinds of things, I believe there'll be an opportunity to ask and get told more than you ever want to know about the subject, but I'm not going to go into that here. But there were two ways of dealing with the land ownership of what is called the Indian title or the Aboriginal title of the people in Western Canada. And one of the ways was to enter into a, a treaty that was put into writing. And the other way was to give land, a piece of paper, here, you're going out, and then you can do whatever you want with that uh, piece of paper. So when I look at those pieces of paper, 
in, in my family, there's a thing on the bottom that says, translated over in the, and then there's a blank language. And then what I saw, I thought was a little bit unusual was sometimes it was Cree, and sometimes it was Ojibwe. And I was wondering, what the heck's going on? You know, the same people who are relatives. Then I realized, that, you know, that the people at home have always spoken all those languages. People are really multilingual. There are still some people today, people my age, uh, depending on the family and the, what language the wife spoke and the husband spoke. There's some people, they spoke Cree language, Michif, some of them only Ojibwe, Michif, English, you know, so it, it, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a mixture. It's a big mixture, and that's what the language is like. It's a mixture. The American Surgeon General, believe it or not, traveled through Western Canada and wrote a report around 1879 or 1880, I don't remember offhand, and uh, you'll find that report in the, uh, in the Smithsonian Institution annual reports of that year, 79 or 80. I forget the name offhand. This is what happens when you get older, your, your memory goes. I can't remember the Surgeon General's name, but he described the language of our people as the polyglot jabber. <laughs> you see, so the polyglot jabber, multilingual. You see? <clears throat> and I know today from speaking to people that there are a lot of words in the languages, in the Cree language particularly, because I spoke more so with people from uh, <clears throat> the western part. A lot of words from French, old French origin in their language. And a lot of people don't know. They don't know the origin of it. But I think that's the way culture is. That's the way language is, you borrow from one another, and that's how I think we enrich things. In fact, that goes to, uh, into the realm of uh, music. I, I remember very well the line attributed to uh, Woody Guthrie. Uh, he said, uh, some people complain that people steal their lines for songs. And, he, and, and Woody said, I don't care. He said, people steal from me, I steal from everybody. And then he said this great line, he said, plagiarism is basic to all culture. You know, so I, I think that's a, a, a really good line. And it, uh, I, I think it, en it, it, enriches, it enriches everybody. I want to disabuse you of one myth that is evolving in Canada. If any of you ever read these things, there are some developments in Canada. I don't want to go into a lot of detail. There's just not enough time and I wander off topic a little bit. But th there, there are some myths that people are promoting as if the Michif people speak one language. That's, that's kind of hilarious, actually, a fact, because it's just not, not any, doesn't even approximate the truth. Where I grew up, I could even recognize, like the people from the north end of the community, they, they spoke a little bit differently from the people from the south end of the community. And you could tell him even, oh, he's from that family because of the way he speaks or the way he uses this word. Oh, that's those people, that's the way they speak, you see? So, and then you're gonna get outsiders coming in for a couple months and try to understand the language. I, I can't see how that's possible. So I think you have to be very careful when you read outsiders' studies, you know, to say, well, what do they really know? You know, how did they get to learn that, you see? So my experience, very, very complicated, you know? So I could give you some examples, in a, you know, in another form. Um, okay, I want to say, um, I, 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 um, Add just a little bit to my commentary about my, my visits. I, two particularly, uh, well, I had several visits now to, uh, to Turtle Mountain. The first time I went with uh, two other people, and uh, we were interested in meeting uh, Ida Rose Allard and I uh, forget the other lady's name, but we met people at T Turtle Mountain Community College. The name of the principal or president at the time was Badger. 
de Montigny. And uh, that's the place where I, I heard someone first say, La Jane. And I thought, what? I'd never heard anybody say that before. You know, and nobody knows. I, a, a linguist came over to my place last summer and uh, I, I brought members of various families from home to help them out because I didn't want to say I knew everything about the language, but this man's studying the language. So I invited about eight people. They live from different parts of the community and they're from different families so that they could all give their, their opinion. And that man couldn't figure out what it means, but everybody at home knows what it means. So I want to uh, acknowledge uh, those, those people, the people who were involved in you know, language uh, pres preservation. And in later years, I came to learn a lot from, in Turtle Mountain from the late Francis Eaglehart Cree. I don't know if you ever heard of him, but I learned a lot about oral history, uh, you know, of the whole area, which is very, very fascinating. And uh, an American historian named Nicholas Vrooman, who lives in Montana, has written quite a bit uh, about uh, those matters. I want to say now a bit about uh, matters related to language from uh, New Zealand first. It was quite some time ago. I don't really know, it might be three decades ago, but, you know, Kayas ago, a long time ago, um, I met uh, Kara Pukatapu, who is a distinguished uh, Maori uh, professional man. Uh, he was uh, New Zealand's top civil servant at some point. But uh, Kara Pukatapu, I think, was a, a genius in the way that he was able to invent language preservation and language promotion uh, mechanisms, institutions. And uh, he is the one that uh, I'm told originated, for example, the uh, Te Kohango Reo, the uh, program for teaching languages to young people. And he also designed something called Tutangata, which is a standing tall program, which is used to support indigenous students throughout all their school years, right through to, to high school. And uh, there are also other people who do related work in Aotearoa, New Zealand. People like uh, Fatarangi Winiata, who was the president of the, of the uh, Maori political party in uh, New Zealand, and also the president at the time of uh, Te Wananga Raukawa, which is a, a Maori college in uh, Otaki, in the North Island of, uh, of New Zealand. And I remember visiting there. And the thing that most impressed me was a program that they had at the graduate level, a course in Maori law and philosophy. Imagine that a graduate program in Maori law and philosophy. Perhaps some of you will be able to inform me after uh, about American programs on indigenous uh, law and philosophy in, in, in your universities. I don't know, I don't know. But I thought it was a wonderful idea. Uh, and the thing is, related to language, is that one of the prerequisites for admission into the graduate program on Maori law and philosophy was fluency in the te reo, in the Maori language. So when I was there as a visitor, uh, I spoke to and met the students, but they never spoke one, one word except in the Maori language. Total, uh, total immersion. So some of you might be very familiar with that. It's an amazing culture. It's an amazing indigenous culture. I don't want to tell you too much about it. Some of you may have seen the haka that is done uh, before the uh, world uh, rugby games. It's an amazing cultural event. 
But I remember being a, a guest of the Minister of Maori Affairs, Parakura Hormia, and he took me to his home community. And uh, I was a guest at the National Maori Speech Making Competition in high schools. So the high schools had speech making in the language by Maori students. And then they had national awards, competitions. And so uh, Parakura was handing out the trophies, some of them really big ones. And of course, one of the fascinating parts of that celebration was the, uh, the Maori cultural way of supporting your people. As some of you probably know, song is a big part of it. So I've always said, I'd flunk out being a Maori, I can't sing. But they, they have you know, gestures and dance that they do, which you know, is just, just absolutely overwhelming. So all the young people you know, from different parts of the, the event was in a great big tent. And every time somebody got a trophy for Maori speech making, their uh, fellow students, you know, in that corner or in that corner or at the front would engage in these, uh, this cultural celebration. It was a great event. The part I didn't like, though, was the fermented corn. If any of you have been to <laughs> New Zealand, <laughs> and you'll know what I mean. Uh, um, one of the things that I, that, that I was tremendously impressed by was uh, Karapukatapu's uh, involvement in the design of modern language uh, and, and other systems uh, that pick the best of the indigenous culture and link it with modern technology to promote better education for the young people. So what it involves was something like this, using things like email at the time, but nowadays I imagine it would be exotic things like Twitter. In my day, if you were Twittering in the back of the class, that wasn't a good idea. But I, 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 tw Twittering is something that they do now, I, I can't do it. But uh, it's the same as saying, in my day, if somebody told you you were all thumbs, that meant you were clumsy. But nowadays, I know some people are all thumbs, they're just amazing how they can write on these little things, you know. So. Life has changed. But what Kara did is genius is to link the best of the Maori culture, which is the family relationships, those strong relationships, and the value of family relationships. And so it, he would link, say, the grandparents through modern technology to encourage the grandchildren in their schoolwork, you see? So I can't provide you with the details because, you know, this is not my field, but I certainly do, you know, admire the many advances that the uh, Maori people have developed in respect to indigenous languages. I find it very, very, very impressive, at least for an outsider like myself. I want to mention in particular, if you don't mind, I want to acknowledge one of my late friends, from Aotearoa, who was the first Maori person to get a doctorate degree in law. And her name was the late Nin Tomas, who, who uh, got a deg um, uh, graduate degree, uh, doctorate degree in law. And unfortunately, she passed away quite young, uh, about three years ago. But what she told me is unbelievable message about language. She went one time, and she's born and raised, she's Maori. And she went to one of those South American countries that borders the uh, Pacific. I forget the name of it, but it's one of those South American countries. She went to some conference there. And for some reason, she could understand what the people were saying. So she began to speak to the indigenous people there in, in Te Reo, in the, in the language of the Maori people. They could understand each other. They could speak. She said, they called me sister. I've never seen that written anywhere in a book. 
Have any of you? I, I, I've seen in writing people wondering about the relations between South America and New Zealand. But this is what I know from speaking people with their, their own experience. That's all I know about it. That's what she told me. I find that absolutely amazing. And I've never seen references to it anywhere else. You know, language diversity is a fact. People speak, say, the same language, but they speak it very differently. I remember one time I was spending New Year's Eve in Lake Taupo, again in New Zealand, high up. It was raining. <laughs> it was cold and rainy up there, the top of the mountain, Lake Taupo. Later on, I went to fish with some Maori women. I think there are four Maori women in the boat. It's, the lake is managed by the Maori. I don't remember how many fish I caught, but I remember I, all the women caught more than I did, <laughs> so I was a bad one. But it's Lake Taupo. And this was a very unique experience because we sat at a table with people from all around the world. And I, we, we counted because we all noticed that in our group. We just happened to be there. That's all. That's why we were there. We just happened to be there in this hotel, it's kind of a resort place. And uh, well, there's a camping ground. I remember we were camping. And it poured on us, and we got up, and we were all soaked, and it wasn't, it wasn't all that comfortable. But there were eight people speaking English, eight, eight different English. All people were speaking one language, English. We could understand each other, but they're all very, very different. And the one that was most difficult to understand was the Irishman. I remember that. Very hard to understand someone with a very strong... Uh, uh, Irish brogan. Something that I learned there, and that I learned when I moved to Australia in 1974, was that in order to understand a language that you're not familiar with, I, I call it, it's something like you got to catch the wave. There's something that you people will know, there's probably a technical term for it, but I experienced it strongly in Australia. I, I couldn't understand anything anybody said for the first three days. And then, bang, I understood. Because you got to catch the way. You know, there's, there's a certain way of speaking. And then until you can ride that wave, boy, it's really hard to understand what people are saying. So that's, that's one thing uh, I noticed. And talking about rhythm, I just want to acknowledge very briefly people who've combined very ancient knowledge, wisdom, and language, and music from Australia. And as you may or may not know, the Australian people have the oldest, and I'm talking about the indigenous people, have the oldest culture on the planet, acknowledged by everybody, over 50,000 years old. And I've had the privilege of spending time, you know, in the bush with people, uh, who've talked to me about their laws and their ways and so on, and the music. And I want to uh, mention in particular and acknowledge the Yunupingu uh, family. A and uh, Galaroy Yunupingu, who, who created a musical band, which is called Yotho Yindi. Maybe someone knows about it. it in, in, the, in the language of the Yolnu people, Yothu Yindi means mother and child relation, mother and child. And they must be pretty good. I mean, as I said, I'm a cultural Philistine, so I can't assess these things myself. My, my assessment wouldn't mean anything, but they, this band, Yothu Yindi, was invited to perform at the Atlanta Olympic opening ceremonies in Atlanta, Georgia, and they were also invited to participate and did in the Sydney 2000 Olympics. So, you know, that's one of the wonderful things that I've seen, in, in, in that people who have the talent, little places, to combine the ancient life, aspects of the very ancient life of indigenous people, and to combine it with modern technology and modern ideas and create something absolutely wonderful 
that everybody can appreciate and people can benefit from. And I think we can see that both in the Unipingu musical tradition as well as in the New Zealand tradition of combining you know, assistance to uh, the young people through education by using the, uh, the, uh, uh, the strengths of the indigenous uh, culture. In a, it was very tough on me when she invited me here. She said, uh, <laughs> we'd like you to do this. I'm teasing. She was not. She was very, very kind and very helpful. But she asked me to say a little bit about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. And I looked at it again. I, w I was not on it, but I, I, know, I know all the people who were on it, uh, a couple of them, uh, Murray Sinclair and Willie Littlechild, I know very well. But um, I had a look at uh, what they said, and I can comment uh, you know, a little bit about it. Um, there's not much on uh, the, the theme of this conference. Not much. I even phoned. There, I have copies of the reports, which weigh about 46 pounds, and about this much room on my shelf. So, don't have that kind of time to peruse that. So I phoned the uh, the office. They have a, a permanent office now, and uh, I asked whether they dealt with this intergenerational trauma. And uh, there's, it's not dealt with as a subject, is what I find. You know, so uh, I didn't, didn't learn anything there. Um, <clears throat> I did have a look at uh, what they call calls, uh, calls for action, which are recommendations. There are 84 of them. And number 10 is about uh, education. And it includes the recommendation to the federal government to, by law, protect the rights to Aboriginal languages, including the t making the teaching of Indigenous languages as credit courses, which is something that Patricia Ningowitz has been involved in doing for a long time. Um, in respect to uh, uh, languages and culture, uh, calls 13 to 17 uh, deal with that, and uh, they uh, include recommendations such as providing funding for revitalization and preservation of languages. And later on, there's a recommendation of indigenous people to strengthen the language. Um, so. There is something there, but it's rather general. As you may know, the United ne Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which deals with international standards that exhort states to do the right thing in the state-indigenous relationship, also exhorts states to assist indigenous people in creating and maintaining their own language institutions. So you have a very strong uh, foundation uh, from these various standards uh, to, to, to uh, make the case for the kinds of things that the ILI does. I'm going to uh, conclude by offering some very, very amateurish comments on the teaching of indigenous languages, which is what you are the expert at. So you may feel free to laugh out loud at the silliness of my ideas. I don't know. Uh, but uh, the way that I thought about it as an amateur is I said, well, I'm going to take the approach that I usually take to analyze things, which is to say, what's it for? Somebody says to me, is this good? Is this bad? What's wrong with this? I say, well, what's it for? What's it supposed to do? And then I ask, 
well, how well is it doing what it's designed to do? That's my simple approach. And what I have found in reading various reports and in making reports, I organized a, a Metrif language conference, for example, in 1985, probably the first one in the world. I, uh, I have a report, if anybody ever wants a copy. I have copies. I also made a submission recently to the federal government through the Ministry of Heritage, as it's called. Um, by the way, the minister is an immigrant uh, person. <laughs> I think there's symbolism in there. I'm not sure what to think about it. But in, uh, in my reading of these uh, various reports, I wonder if some thought should be given to the following. First asking, what's the function? What is this for? And then trying to assess how best can we do what this thing is trying to do? For example, if we look at language, I, I've, I've been able to identify these, these uh, functions or objectives or purposes of language. There might be more. Language of the home. Language of the home. All right. So. Presumably, if a language is to be the language of the home, you want to develop a system that creates or reinforces a language that's going to be used effectively at home. And I think that's a significant part of the Maori language revitalization, because I've talked to people who were adults and didn't speak the language when they were young, but they learned to speak it because they wanted to converse with their children at home. So language at a home, what's the best method? Next, the language of business or the language of commerce. So some indigenous languages may be the language of the home, but there'll never come a day, or we cannot anticipate there'll come a day when it'll be used commercially in doing business, because other people don't know the language. You want to do business with other people. There's another one is the language of ideas, to transmit ideas. We know there are differences in language that reflect ideas, reflect values. That's why it's, it's so important not to lose an indigenous language, because you lose humanity, you lose life, you lose that understanding of the, of the world. So I think we can talk about the language of ideas. So if you wish, if you, if you conclude perhaps, very hard to try to save the language, the language of home, the language of commerce, but you know, maybe we can save those ideas, the way we think about the world, we see the world. It seems to me, and I'm only guessing, that you might want to put that focus at the university level and not at the kindergarten level. You see, what? I, so that's what I mean when I say I think you, you want to adopt different approaches, approaches to suit the purposes of the language. And I, I think also we can conceive the language of culture or ceremony. I'm not sure if those are two distinct, distinct categories or not. But by culture, I mean th such things as, for example, body language, the way you relate to people and have fun with people and so on. How, how to convey expressions of friendship, how to convey expressions of love. We don't do all do those things orally. So the other one is ceremony. And, and, and I think that may or may not be something that is sometimes overlooked. I've seen it overlooked. I sometimes give the example of the Roman Catholic Latin rite, the Mass. 
which, which, which is conducted in the Latin language, which has been a so-called dead language for centuries, which, which persists in the language of ceremony. So depending on the culture and the objectives of a people, perhaps a language could be saved as a language of ceremony. And of course, you might want to save it for all these functions. In closing, I want to pay special tribute to you. I want to pay special tribute to language teachers. And I happen to know a couple of them. Patricia Ningawins is one of those who comes up with absolutely wonderful ways of teaching in Ishnabe one and infuses the culture into it at the same time, which I think is the only way to do things. And in the Cree language, my friend Simon Bird, and if you have these modern machines on computers, you too can uh, you learn with Simon. You have live classes in the Cree language, and, and he does like Pat does, is the, the humor and the language and the, you know, the, the expressions that are chosen to teach people, you know, are specific to the Cree culture and so on. And I think that's very important. So that's something that I've been seeing developing for a number of decades, and I applaud that. If there are some recommendations, advice that I can glean from people like Pat and Simon and others, they might be this. In teaching the language, be patient, be kind. I think that in, uh, in speaking and in thinking in our indigenous languages, I think that ultimately is the best way to try to explore and to understand our world. And that is why I think we can contemplate the idea of a wonderful world. And I would hope that some of the comments that I've been able to make have assisted you to appreciate at least my understanding of the idea that when I speak with my own people, I'm truly understood. Thank you very much for your, 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 uh, your kindness. <laughs>